Good evening, or whatever time it is where you are. Gamshi Lakwan. I'm Mark Harris. Welcome to Diversa TV, uh, the weekly interview show broadcast on Lane TV. Um, tonight's show is uh, the topic is multicultural coalitions. We will be talking with uh, members of the United Coalition of Color, which is a local Eugene group uh, focused on various issues concerning communities of color. Um, if you're new to Diversa TV, uh, welcome. If you're part of our growing legion of fans, welcome back. Our mission, and we choose to accept it, is to illuminate everyday, everyday diversity issues and give the mic and the camera to those who don't always get it. And so to that end, we interview various community members, artists, musicians, activists, etc., to talk about some of the things that uh, they're going through in their lives. And tonight, uh, we're talking uh, with some members of what was called, what became the United Coalition of Color. So to put this in context, a little over a year ago, there was a community forum to, prevent, to present evaluations of Lane County mentorship services to youth of color. Uh, so youth of color, particularly in the juvenile justice system, and this was at Harris Hall. Uh, it was sponsored by Blacks in Government, Central Latino, Calc, uh, Education, Educación y Justicia, the NAACP, and various natives programs within uh, school districts. Uh, we had uh, presentations by Carl Stubbs from Powerhouse uh, Ministries Associates, uh, Maria Chavez Haraldson, who talked about culturally responsive solutions for Latino youth. Mr. Stubbs did uh, African American youth and was moderated by myself. So in the interest also of full disclosure, I am still a uh, vice president of the Eugene chapter of Blacks in Government and I am also a member of the United Coalition of Color. A year ago, we, our agenda was basically to talk about a historical context about services to minority youth in the juvenile justice system. Um, on the date that we're recording this, uh, we're two days away from a, I was part of one of, of two different work groups that was part of a statewide conference on juvenile justice that just convened uh, in Eugene on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, so I gave a historical context from the early days of a particular issue till now and then presented the uh, findings of the two uh, presenters. So we also, Ah, welcome, Shane. Hello. So go ahead and mic him up. And can we go back to um, PowerPoint, please? Thanks. Yeah. So the goal, basically, uh, was looking at healthy community members. So we talk about the community, youth, and the youth are affected by schools, families, juvenile justice, law enforcement and uh, treatment subcontractors to juvenile justice. And we wanted healthy community members produced by culturally competent systems. So in terms of looking at that, uh, let me bring our guests in. So our guests tonight are Juan Carlos Valle, Valle and uh, Shane Martin, the United Coalition of Color. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for having us. Sure. So um, usual, the usual question I ask is, where are you from? Uh, and you can answer that any way you want. In terms of usually the context is, you know, where were you born? How did you come to live in Eugene, et cetera, in Oregon, if you're not native to Oregon? Oh, OK. Well, Mark, I am native to Oregon. Um, um, I'm a Siletz tribal member. I was born over in Toledo. Um, I was raised for the greater portion of my life right here in the Willamette Valley. And I've lived all over the country over the years, but I always seem to migrate back to this area, okay. the old homestead. And I've lived here continuously for the last 17 years. Juan Carlos? Well, first, let me say thank you for hosting us in your program. And we're happy that we have the opportunity to talk about some present and issues of interest for the general community. You say my name is Juan Carlos Valle. I came from Mexico, Mexico City. I was one of 10 uh, brothers. And I came here, oh boy, 
back in the 84, 85, mm. and working in the orchards and the fields. And eventually, through the vine up and, up and down the I-5, I found Eugene as my home. Since 1989, I made Eugene my home. This is my community. I, wear, I, I came here just to go to school and get my GED, my high school, and go back. But Eugene embraced me, and I decided to stick around. And I finished my education, and now I'm involved in different venues throughout the community. Okay, thanks. Um, what is the story of UCC from your point of view? Well, Juan Carlos, I'll let you start. You've uh, been with the UCC for a little bit longer than I have. The UCC is the United Coalition of Color. About a year and a half ago, as you started to talk to your, your audience about, there was a whole bunch of groups of people from different venues, different interests, that wanted to see better treatment in the juvenile system, particularly for the Department of Youth Services. We determined that there had to be a different way for us to engage the authorities, the legal system, into improving services once they came in contact with our youth, specifically with minority youth. We made some observ observations in the inequality of treatment and services being provided to them. So the United Coalition, well, as it came to be, it was really formed of different programs, even nonprofits, professionals, that we agreed to work with each other in addressing this, this issue. And of course, as you know, it turns out that it's not a local issue. This is a nationwide issue. So we formed this group under the name of United Coalition of Color to engage and address different venues to uh, diminish the, the uh, contact for um, our minority youth in the legal system. We were meeting with, in this case, Department of Youth Services and the leadership for over a year. In fact, this month is going to be about a year since we started talking to them about how to best uh, approach different ways and different venues to deliver services to our youth. Hmm. Shane? Um, for me, it's a little bit different story. I became involved with the United Coalition of Color after they had their beginning. And I have a family member who is, uh, he heads up the Springfield Indian Education Program. And he called me up one evening and he said that he was meeting with this group of individuals and he thought that I would be interested because I had been doing a lot of volunteer work with the groups in the area. Um, native groups? Native groups. Mm. Uh, and not just native groups, I volunteer for other groups too. Uh, but his main goal was he wanted a liaison to the recovery groups in the area so that they had some sort of a, a reference, you know, and somebody to go to. Um, and so my whole intention was just to go to the UCC, sit in a couple of meetings, give some information, and then I thought that would be the end of it. And by the third meeting, I realized that we had set goals that needed to be achieved, um, goals that without them, our children were going to suffer. And I've been with the UCC for over a year now, um, ever since. Mm -hmm. Now, when you speak of recovery, because I'm an alcohol and drug counselor, so my bias, my glasses, is that it's uh, substance abuse and addictions recovery, but also cultural recovery. Is that the, is the context that you mean? Um, I mean both. Okay. I, myself, am a recovering alcoholic. Um, I've been through the various recovery programs that are offered here in this area, and I've looked into other recovery programs, and I've come to realize that in order for a person to truly recover from either a disease, whether it be physical or social, you have to understand the context of where they're coming from and where they wish to go to. Um, one of the, the huge problems that we have, especially for the youth, getting them into recovery and staying in recovery is that if you're wandering through life lost um, with no direction, it's difficult to stay in recovery. Mm -hmm. It's easy to get pulled into another direction. Uh, and when I saw what the UCC was doing um, with trying to give some, um, not just cultural background for youth who are wandering lost, but also cultural background to the individuals who, were, who had authority over these youth, um, it became very important to me. Within the system? Within the system, yes. Right. Um, 
Let me expand upon that for a second sure. because uh, one of the things that's really important to uh, acknowledge in terms of dealing with 21st century and also beyond science, all right? One of the things that we found is that if the dominant mode of treatment is 12-step based, 12-step does not recognize cultural recovery. Correct. Okay? It does not, right? And so if you're a person of color, then, and, and you're coming from a particular cultural background where part of what you're recovering is also the cultural protective factors that keep you sober, right? And that you, basically you need to have to, to develop skills um, to cope with emotional uh, slights, which could be like racism, as an example, because uh, I'm an African American, and so in uh, my cultural framework, we deal extensively with dealing with particularly microaggressions, which cause, uh, which are not, you're not being called, for example, the N word, but things that are like insults, micro assaults, things like that, that cause a great deal of stress that people uh, will often tend to relieve using substances. And so, especially if you're a survivor of slavery or a survivor of cultural genocide, that becomes part of the recovery package. So not just staying clean and sober, but also having a positive racial identity. And one of the things that we, can find, we find in treatment and confront in treatment is the fact that we're required to assimilate into a culture that does not recognize us as racial uh, beings with a racial identity where that racial identity is constantly being attacked. Yes, and unfortunately, one of the things that modern science and education tends to ignore um, in today's world is that as far as losing somebody to addiction, um, that loss of identity, although it may not, that may not be understood when an individual gets sucked into addiction, but the loss of identity is a contributing factor because they wander through life lost and they wish to belong. Yes. And one right. of the easiest ways to belong in today's world, unfortunately, is drugs and alcohol. Yes. Yes. Um, and so if we recognize that first when we're trying to bring them into recovery um, and say, here, you have a direction, and this is how we're going to point you, and then we can um, deal with the, the disproportionate minority contact that we have and say, we can help you through this, then these children, when they have somebody protecting them, so to speak, they're more willing um, to go into recovery and stay there. It's not like they're fighting a losing battle. Right. Juan Carlos? You know, it occurs to me when Shane was talking about the cultural aspect of this. United Coalition of Color is working in, in tr trying to reduce and ultimately eliminate the institutionalized racism. And in the context that we're talking about, we're talking about making sure that people that are making decisions for our youth have all the possible tools available to them. One of those tools happens to be that they have cultural background. Now, I'm not saying everyone here, has a cultural background, but not everyone is, has the ability to address the diversion and diversity of a youth. Yes. So if you have somebody in, in an authority where he or she hasn't been exposed to different kids, so now I'm not talking about putting a person of color in those positions. Mm -hmm. Although I wish that that happened, mm -hmm. because there's some things that comes with naturally, for the most part. But what I'm talking about is if we have somebody, as you say, uh, Mr. X, that is a, at a level where he or she has the ability to make recommendations on a kid. This is after they already made contact with the system. Mm -hmm. Let's say, and for the example, kid is already in exactly. The system. Yes. So once they're in in the Department of Youth Services, for example, we want to make sure that the person making decisions on services and programs that they understand the background of our kids. So if there's kids that haven't been guided at all, they've been the sons of the streets, and I can speak from experience, you don't have any, anybody to look up to, but you still have at least some of your culture. Mm -hmm. So naturally, if, you, if the person making decisions for you and on, behalf, on your behalf doesn't know where you come from, they're less likely to make the best possible decision for our kids. Now, if the person knows the other, the other culture, for example, dominant culture, they may be more likely to offer services 
accordingly. Mm -hmm. And that's what the UCC is trying to engage in. We're trying to say, of this number of kids that are incarcerated or in detention, let's or say, for example. Or even contacted. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just say that uh, our population is composed of, just to give a, a number, an example. Let's say our population in the Lane County is composed of 100 youth, okay? Of those 100 youth, in the legal system, they either make contact or they're currently incarcerated, let's say they're 25. With 25 people in there, they're disproportionately more based on how it's reflected in the population. Mm -hmm. Fine, I'm not here, we're not here to talk about how they got to that point. But we wanna talk about once they get to that point, do they have the best services? Are they being offered different services that are culture and diversity and diverse appropriate? Do they have the tools that they need? And if, if not, the United Coalition of Color, for example, this is one of many groups that emerged before. We're saying, why don't we work with you at a different levels of this decision-making map? Why don't we work with you to make sure you have all the tools you need? Because we have an interest. I have an interest on seeing less and less Latino kids, less and less minority youth in the system. To be able to do that, we have to make sure that they have the necessary tools at all levels. At every level that the youth is contacted at. Correct. Yeah. Um, so how do you begin to engage that? So if, if I um, can reflect back on what you've said. Mm -hmm. So if the system, uh, because one of the things that happened at this juvenile justice conference is that uh, one of the current conditions that was acknowledged is that there is evidence of systemic racism. They admitted that. Okay, public document. Well, there is systemic racism throughout the system, every part of the system, because they weren't specific, so that's the context. So if mm -hmm. that's true, well then, what are the implications? How do you, how do you deal with that? And uh, more to the point, for example, within the federal manual that talks about how you address DMC, you're supposed to engage uh, communities of color, but it's not really specific on how you engage them. Uh, so let's talk about DMC. What it, I mean, we've thrown around that term. Uh, let's talk about DMC. What is DMC? Well, DMC, when, when you bring that term up, some people will either cringe or they'll get right into it and say, yeah, let's talk about it. Um, it's kind of hard to have a halfway point on it because uh, most people either thoroughly understand it or they don't understand it at all. And one of the first things that comes up when you start talking about the disproportionate minority contact um, for example, um, DYS says, well, why us? When it is a systemic problem, it starts um, in the family and goes from the family to the community, from the community um, into the social services departments, from those departments it goes and it branches out throughout all of government. Um, and so people say, well, why don't you work with this entity over here and leave us alone? But the United Coalition of Color we had to pick a starting point. We had to choose somewhere to start. Uh, and we felt that we were best suited to start with the Department of Youth Services because right there is a crossing point, sort of, where we can lose more children quicker as opposed to, say, starting with the family, working with families. Now, we do have on our list of goals to get out there with community involvement, uh, work with the families, work with the police departments as much as we can, but um, we chose the Department of Youth Services because we felt that's where we could do the greatest amount of good in the least amount of time. Um, unfortunately, when we started talking DMC with the Department of Youth Services, we didn't find anybody who really wanted to acknowledge that the problem existed. Um, they, they knew it was there, but it was kind of a back burner topic for them because let's just ignore it and maybe it'll go away attitude. Um, but unfortunately, it's gotten worse. Uh, and so when you start talking DMC with them, the first thing that happens is it kind of raises the hackles on the back of their neck, you know, because it's a touchy subject. Here we've had an issue that has gotten worse over the last few years. Um, they've been unable to fix it, so to speak, 
and now they're at a loss. And so they feel kind of like they're being attacked when we ask questions and say, let us help you. Uh, and you know, I just wandered completely off of the point, and I was going somewhere else when you wanted to know what DMC was. Well, it was kind of I, I, I don't think it's off the point. So, oh. for example, I mean, you pointed out, and you know, either people have a, a reaction of you know they cringe or you know they can they can talk about it. So, for example, uh, here's an example of where they cringe because I'm an African American. Well, we'll just go there. So. I, in UCC meetings, have basically identified disproportionate minority contact as a species of institutional racism. So, because in my community, you know, in the black community, you have zero credibility unless you talk about racism, and the way we talk about racism is scientifically, and identify it precisely with a precise evidence-based, in our culture, evidence-based remedy. Okay, so when you say DMC is institutional racism, well, people cringe at the R word, racism, mm -hmm. right? And as if you're calling them racist. No, we're not saying that you are personally racist. We are saying you're part of a system that is producing inequity as part of the normal uh, properties of operation. It's just doing that. So as an example, it's not just the Department of Youth Services. So if we take, for example, a patient zero. So we have now in our history, because I've been personally involved with this issue with this particular department since the late 80s, early 90s. And so we have experience with that and also mm -hmm. in, in our group. So let's take a black kid who uh, is in a car full of white kids and they're all smoking marijuana. Now they get a ticket, they get caught by the cops, so they all get treatment, well actually they all get tickets, but only the white kids get treatment, the black kid gets jail. Now since I know that black kid and in the statistics what I found when we were looking at this issue starting in the early 90s, which is when they first started looking at DMC as a department, their data showed that the standard line was that it, as soon as you get a pot ticket or an MIP, the first offense, a letter goes home. Second offense, you're referred to treatment. Okay? So they had noticed that all the black kids that had multiple offenses like nine in the case of the one black female, or five in the case of one black male. So multiple offensive never got referred to treatment at all. So what we know about substance abuse is if it's untreated, they, the, problem, the crime problems continue. So it was only until I actually met this individual that was the single kid that got the pot ticket as an adult coming to Lane Community College out of prison and all his offenses were drug related and he got no treatment and he was a department of youth services client i can name that person all right so that was the data all right that was the facts so one of the ways that we approach dmc in the black community okay this is like health disparities okay so addiction is a health problem so you need to apply the correct treatment so one of the questions that we ask in UCC is, okay, what about the black kids in treatment? Are they successful? And if they're not successful, are you giving them standard 12-step treatment which doesn't mention racism? Are you giving them racial, racial coping skills? Are you giving them positive ethnic identity identification? Are you talking about role models? Are you talking about you know, the usual remedies? Okay, that are in the science. So this is not even anything new. This is about positive youth development within a positive cultural context. So, for example, one. You are making, we are making the assumption in, in the case and the later example you presented to us that services are being offered. Yes. Once the service is being offered to a black kid, Latino yes. kid, so on and so forth, what is the success rate? Yes. You know, what is the recidivism? Yes. Are they successful in life? And so, so recidivism so is they, you know, either relapse or they go back to committing crimes after being in the exactly. system. Exactly. <laughs> so, in other words, in the in the academia, you may say we, this is the intervention, this is the result, right? If you don't have an intervention, then this is what happened versus the one that we did intervention. 
So we make an assumption that those services are primarily being offered. Right. But we're saying, United Coalition of Colors saying, the services are not even offered mm. to our kids, to our minority kids. So we're saying, what, what is giving? What, at what point, and we call that decision point, are you saying and you're making available these programs? To say, you have, say you have 10 kids, and all those 10 kids, you have eight uh, white kids, and you have an African-American and a Latino, for example. And all the eight the kids uh, were offered, the white kids were offered services, and but the other two didn't. So you could not begin to even have the conversation about did this intervention work yeah. two years down the road. Right. Because that it was not even part it of the picture. It wasn't even offered. Okay. Right. So we're saying, okay, why not? Is it because they don't know that, that the services are available to them? Is it because delivering the service, they're not ready to deliver the service to a non-white person? We're trying to ask, answer those questions first before we can even engage into whether or not some kind of treatment is working. Mm -hmm. Now, the disproportionate minority contact refers to the over-representation of our youth yeah. in this system. Right. Yeah. That's really what it is. And we're saying, okay, fine, once you're there, and again, you presented an example earlier, everybody's smoking pot. Everybody's at fault, right? Everybody's carry out to the, the juvenile, okay? After, after they're there, we're interested. What happens to them after that? Yes. Once they're there. Right. Are they getting all the services they should be getting? Yes. If not, the United Coalition of Colors saying, why not? Is it because of resources? What can we do to make sure and ensure those resources? Is it, is it cultural competency? Is it training? And again, we're no longer saying we need to have a person that looks like me in those positions. We're saying we need to have somebody who has all the tools available. Yeah. Is it about information? Is it about use awareness? You do, not, you do not engage a Latino kid or an Indian kid Native American kid, the same way you would engage a white kid. So if you do not know that, right from the get-go, you're having problems. Yeah. If you don't tell them, oh, here's some services that we might be able to help you do this so-called intervention. So what we're talking about here is, are we offering services that are appropriate for our youth? If not, let's work with you. At what point those services should be offered to our kids. If they're not offered here, why not at this level? We're finding out that if not at the initial level, not at the second level, maybe later it's being mentioned, but not even then. Now, don't get me wrong, departments across the nation have at least a person that acts as an advocate. The Department of Youth Services, for example, does have a youth advocate. Yes. But what we're trying to do is to say, can we make this person available at different levels to see if we can detect at what level should those services be available to them. And after they provide the kind of training and so on and so forth, we're finding out that that person should be involved at the very, very initial level because that person may know more about culture appropriate programs that obviously the people that are there is still lacking. They're doing okay, but there's still a lot more. They, they, there's a lot more that they need to do. So the position um, you're referring to, the minority youth advocate, I believe? Yes. Um, so one of the things that kept coming up at the state level is that uh, Oregon apparently is, at, uh, is being looked upon as a pioneer and at the forefront of dealing with uh, DMC issues in the nation. Uh, and the, the various state officials that actually said that said, you know, which doesn't mean we can't do better, but they said you can't even have this conversation in a number of the states. They don't even have some of the infrastructure. So, you know, that you should, you know, be patient and balance that with, uh, you know, the work that you're doing and not get frustrated. Uh, how do you respond to things like that? Well, that's um, difficult to respond to without going to extremes one way or the other. Um, if you take a hundred people and 50 of them are white and 50 of them are brown and you ask the 50 white people, well, 
are you, do you believe in racism, are we racist? 50 of those people will say, well, I'm not racist, therefore they assume that the system isn't racist. And so all of a sudden you have 50 people saying that they're not racist or they don't believe it exists, and so everything must be all right. And so 50 people will tend to ignore the problem. And then on the other side, if you take 50 brown people who have dealt with this their whole life, and you ask them, does racism exist? They'll say, oh yeah, it does. It, I experience it every single day, and we can't change it. So you've got these two groups. Two extremes. Yeah, yeah. two extremes. Mm. Uh, and they're having a hard time meeting in the middle. And mm -hmm. that's what the UCC is all about. We're trying to meet in the middle. We're trying to show both sides that there is a middle common ground that will benefit everybody. Uh, and so one of the things that we have to do is we have to make it socially acceptable for both sides to say, okay, this exists, what are we going to do about it? Uh, and like with most pioneering um, ideals, somebody's got to start. And for those start, for those fledgling groups like us, it's difficult because yourself, Juan Carlos, me, I've dealt with it my whole life. Uh, and a white person cannot understand it until they've walked into a room of 30 individuals and they're the only one in there of that color. Then they will understand it. But until that happens to them, they can't possibly comprehend what's going on. Well, certainly on a superficial level if, you know, they're not used to doing that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on a superficial level. They right. might not necessarily look at uh, how, uh, because they, you know, they've been raised on a Columbus Discovered America narrative. They've been given, you know, evidence in school that their people existed and contributed, you know, to the historical narrative, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it should be said that, you know, this is not the first time that a group of, like UCC has ever existed, and certainly not the first time that uh, a group of people of color have tried to engage this particular agency or engage in this process. Um, I've actually witnessed several processes, both in this state, uh, other states, and nationally. So one of the things that I've been able to observe is, yeah, this is actually typical. Everything that we've experienced is typ typical and predictable. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, in terms of looking at, right, who's going to basically t talk about, you know, their experience, and are you going to take it personally, or are you going to be able to hear it, are you going to basically look at, okay, DMC is not simply about counting numbers and relative rate indexes. So, for example, just disproportionality is a difficult concept for folks. So, all things considered, basically, if, you know, when you flip a coin, you have two chances of it coming up heads or tails, and the probability is 50%, right? So in your population, if you have only 1%, say African Americans, 1% Native Americans, et cetera, et cetera, you should expect, you know, that like cancer occurs, incarceration occurs, literacy occurs at the same rates, whatever it is relative to the population. If it's more than twice, then something other than chance is producing it. There is a structure producing the inequity. And that's one of the things that's difficult to understand about DMC. You can look at, you know, numbers such as relative rate indexes, but in communities of color even understand those numbers, what we're more concerned about is the people. They're not numbers to us, they're actual people being treated in a particular way, either denied service or not getting the service that will actually get them through the system. And we can also make that case for certain types of white kids, too, because that's also our concern as well. We're focusing on youth of color, but our interest is also equity for all youth. See, it occurs to me when you started talking about, you know, Oregon being the pioneer, and I can say, well, I can initially... People say that, I yeah. can, you know, stand up and jump up and down, but not, not for the reasons you might be thinking about. I, I'm, I'm happy because then... The focus will be in Oregon to see about what we do, to finally bring the attention. And once you have the attention, once you have the spotlight, then you are accountable. And in the end, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, accountability. Accountability. Yeah. So, but see, to be able to do that first, you have to understand and recognize that you cannot do this alone. This out of a famous video. Mm -hmm. I need you and you need me. We're in this together kind of thing. Yes. Now, I have an interest on 
seeing less and less Latinos, less and less African Americans, and so on and so forth, detained. I want them to see them in schools and, you know, starting their own business and so on and so forth. But see, back to the legal system, you have to first recognize and own up that they're not able to do everything. And that's when the pushback comes. You talked about using different processes. I've been through a few myself. What's different in this case is that now, although the attention is on our people and engaging a public entity in this, in the, in this case, it's also about our group, yes. the United Coalition of Color, right. for example, that we are getting together. We are getting into agreements to work with each other. These are professional, yes. people that work with the kids, people from the community, volunteers, people that bring their own, their own experiences to the table. In the process, we're learning about each other. We're saying we have commonalities. The main one, obviously, we want to see less and less of our kids being detained. And if they're detained, what can we do so that services are provided? But see, then, you expect the accountability from the other person, the person that's making the decisions. In this case, Department of Youth Services. So let's just say Manager X. As a taxpayer, I'm expecting Manager X to, to have enough knowledge, all the available knowledge, to be able to present different options for our kids. See, and because a person is in that position, he or she may not really own up to that he or she doesn't really have the tools right. and the abilities. Right. So that's where it starts. And if you're not able, not comfortable in that position to say, I need help. My gosh, there's this group called United Coalition of Color, and they're willing to help me? How is elevating? to have all these professionals, people, practitioners, people that work directly with our kids saying, I'm here to help you. In the process, we're asking questions. But see, the problem is that in some ways, people in those kind of positions, they're simply not used to somebody like me asking questions because they haven't, they haven't seen somebody like me ask questions. Well, how do you arrange your data? Well, tell me about this number. Well, what's the correlation? Because I'm speaking at the same level that may or may not be ready and used to. So that's the, the institutionalized racism that we're talking about. Because they're not used to having me wanting to be a part of the solutions. Right. Having me bring the tools that, I, that they need. See, we're no longer talking about giving all the responsibility or the accountability to the, the, uh, the white people. Tell them, come here and fix my problem. I do not subscribe to that. And I do not subscribe to that because we now have the tools. We, as you will say, the brown people, we have the tools, the professionals. We have something to bring to the table. And when that happens, in some ways, it's being pushed back. Man, when we're man, asking questions, man. we're worth questioning. When we're asking for data, we're, we're threatening. So again, it really goes back to that person in that position being comfortable with me saying, oh, well, you need that information. Let me work with you. And you need the information because you want to help me. Changing that paradigm is what's really keeping us from moving forward in some ways. And I, and I think that's, that's, that's dead on accurate in terms of um, part of the process that I observed that you know, the feds want uh, efforts that are in terms of DMC efforts. They want, they want it to be data driven. On, we have no problem with that. You know, the question, the problem is, is you know, what data we're asking for, which is actually not off the wall. It's like we're not asking about simply numbers of kids in the system. We're asking, what are you doing with kids in the system, and what are the outcomes? Not only that, but what is the training of the people that you have dealing with these kids in the system, and are they applying the correct? remedy for the kids in that system mm -hmm. okay we see that you have been you know, you've become more diverse than say the early 90s how did you get more diverse do you understand why you have gotten more diverse and have you strategically and selectively gotten more diverse and how do you support that diversity once it's in your department so these are the kind of questions that make them uncomfortable. We're not attacking you personally. We're asking the logical, evidence-based questions that you ask in this effort when you're dealing with diversity. 
So it's not simply just, did you get diversity training, but what was that diversity training, and was it skill-based? And has that changed your policy in terms of dealing with these folks? So as an example, um, I was part of the work group for this juvenile justice conference. And uh, we noticed that, OK, you're not having any youth talk about their experiences in the system. So at the DMC conference, the governor's DMC conference, there was a panel of youth. So you need to have a panel of youth. And moreover, not just a panel of youth, these need to be youth that can articulate what happened with them in the system and how they are getting on with their lives now. All right? Now, they did have a panel of four youth, all of whom were working, but they were all youth of color. Now, the majority of youth in the system are white youth. So interestingly, OK, so why don't you have any white youth <laughs> on this panel? That's one question. OK, now you had a youth of color. OK, one is you know, working in the subway, and he's also you know, working on his degree. He's going to be a child psychologist. One is already working within the juvenile justice system. Another you know, has his own business, and et cetera, et cetera. And another is doing outreach gang work. Okay? And he's describing, they're describing his experiences. So I can say, you know, just as a witness, all right, none of the questions that were asked to the panel, to the group, dealt with institutional racism, even though the materials, you know, ex so there's systemic racism. How do you have a panel of youth of color without talking about their experience of racism in the system or their experience of racism in Oregon? So I asked that question as part of the Q&A. And only the native and the black kid even spoke to it. And the native kid basically talked about how he remembers one of the things that helped turn him around because he was alienated from his culture in the system and he had no uh, evidence that there was any native culture until he got to the state training school, or rather Hillcrest and McLaren, where they held sweat lodges. Now, having been in this state and being part of the, the support for fighting to even have sweat lodges, and it was a battle to have sweat lodges, to have culturally relevant treatment services or even programming within prison, just like in the adult system. Okay? And there was resistance, and it was racist in nature. But they finally got sweat lodges at you know, the two places that he was in. And he said, that was the key to turning me around. And he said, it was a volunteer, not a staff person, running the sweat lodge. And he said, you have to be there to represent the kids coming through. You have to be there, because they're not paying me to come in here. And if he hadn't volunteered, there would have been no cultural services at all. Okay? Rather than the state hiring culturally competent natives to run culturally competent services. I mean, that's part of the institutional racism. And how you cure it is you have the services that will actually cure people as part of their culture. And if it's difficult to understand that, I mean, there is evidence to suggest that in all kinds of databases. Now the question becomes, what do you do for white kids? Well, that's not necessarily for people of color to define, but we could would have you ask that question. So what are some of UCC's goals, as you've, as you've talked about? Um, well, of course, our primary goal is to decrease DMC. Uh, and has it always been that from the beginning? Um, from, from my standpoint, it has been, because that right there is the tip of the iceberg. And once we begin to um, reduce that, everything cascades into place. Because in order to reduce that, they have to have culturally proficient people um, who are willing to listen and who are willing to act. Uh, and through those actions, we can help reduce it. Um, but another one of the UCC's goals uh, is understanding. You know, we need to get people 
um, who are in positions of authority to understand that the pink elephant exists. <laughs> you know, the pink elephant of racism. Of racism yeah. exists. It's right there in the middle of in your the room. room yeah. You know, and they're just walking around it, walking around it. Well, it's not happening here. It um, doesn't really stink of elephant poop here. No, mm -hmm. not at all. That, you're diluted. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. You know, and one example of that is when we first began meeting um, with the county. One of the reports that they gave us on, on DMC showed that over a 10-year period, um, it had actually increased. Uh, and we asked them why this was happening, and they said, well, we don't know. We're still doing the same thing that we've been doing. We're just doing it harder. Uh, and every one definition of insanity. I know from the recovery. Go ahead. Yeah, Go is ahead. doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome. <laughs> and, you know, and that's what they're doing. Um, year after year, they've done the same thing. Oh, we had an increase in it. Well, let's do it harder, you know. Um, so they need to change. Um, so we need to have that cultural understanding on both sides, yes. not just right. their side, but on our side as well, you right. know. Both sides There's need to understand. There's definitely a learning curve for you and UCC to go through. Yes, there is. Yes. Um, and so we need that, uh, that understanding. And then once we get the understanding, we need to move both sides together to work for the common good. I mean, because let's face it, our children are our future. Yes. And it's not just um, the brown child. It's not just the white child. It is the children. And if we can make um, the white children or the brown children's lives better, then the other group's lives will be better also. It's just the way that it works. And the difficult part, um, at least for me from where I'm working at, um, the most difficult part is to get people to let their defenses down enough to be re-educated. Yeah. Because um, the United States today has pounded into people, boom, boom, time after time after time. This is the way it is, and you can't change it. Hmm. But I'm here to tell you that it can be changed. One person at a time, you, you, me, the people out there, one person at a time, we can change it. And we will, because if we don't, we're doomed. The world is becoming a smaller and smaller place day by day. And pretty soon, we're all going to be forced onto this planet, Mother Earth. And if we don't learn to get along, we're going to destroy each other. Right. We've seen it. We have, we have seen over and over that the people that have direct contact with the youth at, in this case, DYS, simply do not know our kids. And as Shane stated, you know, amongst all our goals, we also have to talk about how we go about it. How we go about it is we make observations. We ask for information. We ask for numbers. We even ask for how many people of color have been hired in the last several years. How you got the information back, that's a different story. Well, we've got some information. Correct. But, but yeah. we, have to, we have done some court observations. We have done tours of DYS and the programs. And we engaged different uh, individuals there. And the goal is to understand what they do and how they go about doing some things. So we are not about you saying, well, you need to change this and change that. We have to understand the inner workings how they get to, to where they got. Now, it is true that if you keep on doing the same thing, nothing changes, you, you are more likely to get the same thing. But what if, what if you have people there working at DYS in this case that know our kids? They, perhaps they look like them, like, you know, Latino advocate, Latino counselor, and so on and so forth. They, more likely than not, will bring the knowledge that I call community knowledge. They will bring down knowledge. They will immediately, or at least eventually, connect with those kids. Now, these are kids that might be forgotten in some areas, some circles. Okay. So if the main barrier is that you don't know those kids, even getting to the next level as offering services might take you longer. And what if we can reduce that by just having somebody there that knows our kids, knows their needs, knows the family background, or at least is able to either investigate or educate themselves. 
Well, Shane used the term culturally proficient. Now, that, that specific phrase is actually c comes from, um, and I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth, but uh, Dr. Terry Cross is a Native American who came up with the construct of cultural competency. And he actually says there's a stage beyond cultural competency called cultural proficiency. So there are basically it's a six-stage model which starts at cultural destructiveness, at et cetera, et cetera. And I could actually show it, but you know we're running out of time, so I don't want to do a mini teach on that. And we'll have to figure out how to do that later. But a culturally proficient person is not simply a person of color. It could right. be anyone. Correct. Right. Correct. Yeah. So yes, one level is to have you know to match the colors, but not every person is culturally competent even within their own culture. You know, so it's not just knowing the kids, it's also applying the appropriate remedy, which may or may not be from their culture. It may be from somewhere else, and applying that. So that's culturally proficient. That's, what you're, that's part of what you're talking about. Correct. You know, I, I stated earlier that I am not necessarily saying I want to see somebody like me. That would be great to have somebody like me at DYS there are with a all few. the skills. There are and, a few. And not enough yeah, but, yeah. to satisfy the numbers that they have. Yeah. So what we're left to do is to make sure that those individuals, those counselors, those managers, those directors have all the skills and abilities. They can probably get their hands on to be able to address the issues. And we're saying, you don't have A, B, and C tools. We will work with you to attain those skills. Yeah. That's what United Coalition is doing, yeah. so to work with them. What's next? We have about five minutes. So what's next? What's next is community involvement. Um, we're not going to drop what we're doing and trying to work with DYS and trying to um, help to train them culturally, uh, but we've hit such a dead wall with them that we needed to explore the other avenues um, and what we came up with was community involvement because there is a lot that um, the people, the families and the youth who are involved with DYS need to be educated on what their rights are when they are taken in, um, the fact that they have an advocate. Most of the youth, I found this out when we did the tour of the facility, most of the youth they don't know if the youth understands what they're being told when they're brought in. Um, I asked the specific question, does the youth understand his rights? And the answer was, we don't know. They got miranda but They got miranda That was it. They don't know if the youth understands it. Um, they don't know if the youth understands that a youth advocate is somebody A minority who's, youth advocate. Minority is youth advocate right. is somebody who's on their side to help them. Um, most youth, when they hear a uh, youth advocate, they think an authority figure, and so, oh, they don't want none of that. So they don't really understand exactly what their options are. Um, so we need to begin educating um, the families and the children and let them know that these resources are out there for them um, so that they can ask, yeah. hey, I want to talk to the minority youth advocate. I want to see what you know, my rights are. I need to have this explained to me and let them know that although they have been brought into the system, they do have rights, um, and they have their, you know, within um, the legal system, they have a right to express it. And most of them don't understand that. We, yes, and we also have to engage the rest of the community, the entire community, in this subject. Because when we have kids in detention, we all lose. You know, it is proven that for one dollar we invest in prevention, we save ten dollars on the road. Yeah. So that's what it's all about, to have a larger conversation as next steps, to continue to engage, in this case, DYS, and of course, the, the entire legal system. DYS and the representatives, they, they, they're right. This is not only about DYS. This it really involves a lot of people that really come into contact with the youth. When somebody does X behavior or X crime, the officer that's taking the report, the officer has a lot of authority or you know a lot of influence into what he or, he, he or she writes in the report. Yeah. And since if you're they, a member of the police commission, you have the ability to speak to that. Exactly. So we would want to make sure that an officer is also educated 
in that if they need to identify a youth of color, that they find a way to do it. So that when DYS gets them, they go, oh, we have a person of color, a youth of color. Do we have any services available? Right. Is the community ready to help uh, engage DYS and the entire legal system into how much money we're spending on, on detention? Yeah. Are there any other preventive means that we can do this? Those will be the next steps. Yeah. Conversation, bring somebody to educate another in the community. Dr. Harold Briggs, for example, Anya, for example, that we might bring yourself to the United Coalition of Color. I want to thank you both for coming. Thank you for thank having you us, for having Mark. Us. Yeah. Uh, just wanted to remind you, and you just, whenever you hit a block, that's usually when a breakthrough is about to happen. So keep at it. Thank I know you. you're going to. Thank you. If you like what you've seen, uh, email us at liveclass at lanecc.edu. Put diversity TV in the subject line. Tell a friend. And uh, you can also use this means to talk, suggest what you'd like to see for future shows. Uh, until that, go well, stay well.